I think we can go ahead and get started. Thank you for uh, showing up today for our meeting. I know that this is a busy time of year uh, getting started and with the <clears throat> extra issues of COVID and, you know, I'm sure that's keeping a, a lot of you very busy. So thank you for your work uh, that you're doing right now and the leadership that you're providing. But, uh, and also thank you for joining us today and taking time out to uh, help our state move forward. Seems like a long time since we met. <clears throat> and uh, actually, I guess it was the month of August. I hope everyone is off to a great start in 21-22 school year. Um, it's always a fun time in the beginning of the year and I hope you're enjoying it as well. Today, we have presentations on uh, data that's been collected today uh, that we'll be talking about during the first part of the meeting. And the second part of the meeting, we're going to establish and organize subcommittees in the three areas of focus that we were given by Randy when we started this task force. So at this time, what I'd like to do is turn it over to uh, Jared and Melanie uh, to uh, bring us up to date on the data we've been collecting and uh, what we're hearing from outside uh, in the state of Kansas. Yeah, so Jared, Melanie, you're on. Yeah, I'll get started here. And Melanie, I'll turn it over to you. Jim, thank you uh, so much. So I, I just will uh, preface this by we have a, a lot of data to share this morning. Um, I have uh, shared a lot of this with the chairs of the subcommittee also. So when you guys break into your subcommittees, uh, you may have uh, an opportunity to dive into this a little bit more. So uh, we're gonna uh, share a little bit about the uh, some data from the last meeting, some of the, the questions and comments and feedback that the task force had. Task force had. Uh, I'm gonna share some data from 2010 from a study that KSDE did. Um, I will tell you also, Jim, at this point, we have almost uh, 200 students or uh, former students that have responded to our student survey. So uh, Melanie and I have done our best and, and we haven't quite gotten through all of that data. Um, so that will probably be info that we will share um, at the next meeting, but that is a that is an outstanding, and I appreciate each and every one of um, you guys here that have reached out to students, um, and that's a, that's a great feedback that we're going to get uh, from them. So, Melanie, if you want to start, I will share my screen, and we can get started with some of the data that you had. That sounds great. Thank you, Jared. Present this. There we go. Is that where you want me to start? That is perfect. Yeah. So um, I wanna thank you all for taking the time to, to have these conversations in the small groups. So now I'm going to share an overview of the data that was collected from the two small group discussions that we had um, at each of the two meetings in July, which at this point feels like a really long time ago. So as a refresher, uh, the second graduations requirement task force meeting was on July 8th. And during that meeting, that was the Ohio meeting. So we heard from Graham Wood and Sarah Wilson, and they described how Ohio moved toward a model that focused on personalized learning. They talked about valuing proficiency and creating opportunities for students to choose courses of study that are based on their own personal interests and passions. And so we heard about the diploma seals as well, and those can be used to highlight a student's accomplishments in specific areas of interest. Um, for example, they have a science seal, um, they've got a community service level seal. And then after that presentation, we met in the breakout rooms for group discussions. And this is the aggregated survey responses from those conversations. So after we learned about Ohio's model, we asked, the group was asked, all three groups were asked, I should say the individual groups, what do you need to know more about from today's meeting? And there was significant agreement from the task force members that the process that they used in Ohio was really fairly extensive, complicated. So you said, we wanna know more, we wanna know how to make it easier to understand this process when we're describing it to stakeholders, to parents, um, when we're trying to get buy-in. And then also, how do we make this process a little less complex here in Kansas? Um, because we are working on a shorter timeline than they had in Ohio. Ohio's, Ohio's process took years and we're trying to kind of reach some consensus by early next year. And then you also asked for information on what is required as part of the process, um, what policies are in place in Kansas that we need to consider 
And there was discussion around what are the non-negotiables, if any, from KSD. And that was a theme that, that came up several times was what are the non-negotiables? Um, finally, there were a few folks that voiced concern about, you know, how do we get it right the first time? And then under the stakeholder involvement and wanting more data, there were questions about an appropriate balance of academic requirements versus electives. You said you also wanted to hear from colleges um, and you wanna hear what, specifically from colleges, you wanna hear what it is that they want students to have as far as skills when they're coming into their institutions. What are they lacking? Um, and then finally, you, we said, what is the goal um, what change are we seeking? And you wanted to know, are we as a task force working in the confines of just credit hours? Are we looking at, at those as numbers or is it something else? Are we supposed to be focused on figuring out the right amount of core requirements or should we be focused on defining values in education? And for me, as I worked through this data, this was kind of a, this was the pinch me moment that we've talked about before. Like, are, are you sure that we can do this? Or are, they, are we actually, are we allowed to do this is kind of what those conversations and questions felt like. How big can we go? Um, Jared, if you wanna go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, there we go. Cool. Um, so in the second question that day, then you all came right back to the stakeholders from that first question. And you said, let's define stakeholders. And so in different comments, dif stakeholders were defined as parents, students, business and industry groups, employers, uh, the state board, and the governor's education task force committee was specifically mentioned. And then you also said you'd like to understand the data from the Kansas Can success tour. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, that is where Commissioner Watson is right now. And then you on, on a, let's see, what's the definition of success is the second bar that you see there. And these are related, but different. Um, some asked for success stories. You wanted to hear specifics about what's happening around the state. You know, what are we doing already that defines post-secondary success? And, and can we point to that? How does that compare to what is currently written in terms of graduation requirements? Um, others voiced a desire to discuss this some more in small groups. This was a, a piece of the conversation that you, you wanted to talk more about. You said, and I'll use a quote here, we need to make sure that it moves students to the desired outcome of post-secondary success. And then um, focusing on specific subjects, you wanted to make sure that we were discussing the specifics of EL, diversity, you wanted more conversation on market value assets and employability skills, and then to ensure that the task force is addressing specifically financial literacy and civics. Another quote, Kansas must change to embrace future success for our students. How can we create demand for improving our system? And then getting buy-in, of course. Um, so we can move on to the next slide, Jared. And this was the end of the first meeting in July. So that was the July 8th meeting. And then we moved to the July 22nd meeting where we heard from Dr. Cynthia Lane. She serves on both the Governor's Council on Education and the Advantage Kansas Coordinating Council. And she talked about their shared vision for um, driving towards a more robust Kansas economy. And so a lot of that conversation was economy centered. Uh, she touched on work-based learning, she touched on CTE and support for the redesigned schools um, through experiences and outcomes. And then Susan Wally presented with Prep KC and talked to us about market value assets and identifying employability skills again there. And so coming out of those presentations, we asked the small groups, um, what do you need to know more about today's presentation? Same question. And so there was, you know, a lot of times the same conversations are happening in different breakout rooms, right? And I think that's what you see from this data here. Um, the rooms were kind of having the same conversations by themselves in different corners. And so we got a lot of different answers, um, but at the same time, the same answers. So there were, there are three key questions that, that rise to the top there on that chart. Um, the groups basically said, we want more information about market value assets and what that selection looks like. And then how do we diversify this experience for students? It's really hard for students to make decisions. Uh, I'll just quote, it's hard to make decisions about your future when you don't know what you've never seen. And then um, a few more quotes from those responses. What's the best plan to move from our current pilots in high school um, out across the state into full implementation? And so you're asking about the the technicalities of, of what does this implementation look like? And then finally, um, the groups 
often come back to what are they doing in other states? What have others done? And so another quote here, are there models of graduation requirements that include types of experiences rather than content? Meaning, should we require all students to have some form of experiential based education? Um, and back to that comment that we heard earlier, you know, are we just counting credits here or are we talking about experiences? Uh, next slide. And then what should we keep about our current graduation requirements? So we, at this point, had an overview and the group came back and really everyone said, you know, there was a lot of general agreement that of course we're gonna keep the core subjects, ELA, math, science, social studies. Um, but then in various comments, we began to tack on all of the other things. So you also said, but maybe the requirements aren't, maybe the current requirements aren't necessary. Does every kid really need four, four units of math? Um, essentially implying, you know, is three enough? Is two enough? Um, and then on top of those, there was a desire for continuing to offer a wide range of electives for discovery opportunities. And those, those come in all different names. Um, there were arts, tech electives, um, problem solving. Somebody mentioned, um, I wanna see a, you know, we wanna see a communication class that goes beyond just being a speech class, um, but really focuses on that, what we might consider a soft skill of communicating. And then um, that leads to the next one on the list, which is the individual plans of study for students. Um, let's see. I think we're still on the previous slide, Jared. Oh, sorry. Oops. There we go. This one? There we go. Oh. Um, individual plans of study. You said keep these. Um, authentic relationships with students are a key driver of building student aspirations. I thought that was a, a good quote. And then some other comments around, do we keep any of it? Uh, there was a, a group that kind of banded together and in different ways said, uh, one person said in particular, I think it's all on the table. And someone else said that they were unsure. Um, you know, should we keep anything? I don't know. Um, quote, we haven't heard anyone, businesses or colleges identify what they actually like about what we currently have. Next slide. And then why do we need to change? Um, so we heard a lot during this day's presentations about Kansas communities and the economy and the responses here reflected the impact um, with a theme of needing to evolve to meet the needs of workforce. And there were many of the comments insinuated meet the needs of workforce and also communities in the context of keeping people in their communities, which was interesting to read about. Um, so. A quote is, there's significant disconnect between the education that students are receiving versus the education needed to be successful individuals of society. Specifically with the data presented, our state is in desperate need of change to educate and maintain a consistent population for our local economies. And then there's also the big question of seat time and funding. And so that one really popped up. Um, you know, if a student isn't in a seat, then how do we, how is that counted? Uh, they're out there getting real world experience. How do we account for that? And then um, a last quote, if nothing else, can we remove the seat time requirements for credits, credential or certification? This would open up schools to respond to the needs of communities and allow for different, sorry, and allow for regional differences. Um, so there's, there's a lot of fun back and forth, um, you know, where we're asking questions of ourselves, but at the end, you know, these are a lot of questions. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Jared. Um, oh, and, and I guess you, you spoke to uh, asking everybody to speak to a minimum of two students. And so we're working through that data now as well. And that's all I've got. I'm looking for that's Aaron. a lot. I'm still muting. Sorry, uh, Melanie. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. It, does anybody have any questions? We, I think we have a minute here for a question if there was any. And if you do have any, you're welcome to follow up. Yeah, stick them in the chat. Uh, I think I think the good thing about this, and I, I talked with Melanie this morning and 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 Jim, is a lot of these questions. I feel really confident that 
we're in the right spot here as a task force as we get into subcommittees is that's where a lot of these questions and we get a little bit more specific um, is that's exactly where we're going to answer these questions and so I think um, as we look at some of the the feedback that that the team gave and that the, the task force has given uh, we're, we're kind of in the right spot right now to start breaking up some of those things uh, I'm going to share real quick um, and I'm going to go ahead and apologize because I am not as uh, Good, as good with my graphs as as Melanie is. So I, I'm gonna, hopefully this isn't gonna uh, look too bad here when you guys see this, but in 2010, so I'm gonna share some information um, of a, a graduation requirements conversation that the state board had in 2010. Um, and this report is probably roughly 50 pages long uh, or more. And there is a lot of information here. So I tried to break it down uh, the best I could. Uh, the, the state board had a discussion about grad requirements and whether or not the state should consider increasing requirements in order to ensure that students are career and college ready. And so these are some results from uh, a survey of superintendents in 2010. I, I will tell you, I, I feel like some of this is still very applicable, um, even in today's uh, environment. So this was the survey. These are the questions that were asked. So they asked, uh, what, what are certain grad requirements or what are grad requirements by, um, by district? And so I have a, a, a list that I've sent to the chairs and, I, and I'll show you that. Um, above the 21 credits. So some districts require 24, some 28, some 25. Um, you know, the percentage of students taking four years of math in your school, the percentage of students taking reading classes, uh, math classes, those are for assessment purposes. How many districts offer uh, JROTC? Um, this one is, how is the senior year made meaningful? should grad requirements be increased and if the state were to increase what content areas and number of credits and then there was a lot of general comments after that so i'm going to do my best here to kind of show you guys a little bit um, from that survey so this is a graph here this is percentage of students taking four years of math and you can see there's roughly there was in 2010 there was roughly close to 100 districts in our state that had zero percent of their kids taking four years of math um and, and then as we move forward there was roughly 10 to 12 that had about 75 percent of students taking four years of math and, and keep in mind this was in 2010 um so the more the higher percentage, the less number of districts. Uh, districts offering, offering junior ROTC. Uh, in 2010, there was 38 districts that had a uh, ROTC program. Uh, five of those offered a PE credit for that. And um, 261 districts did not, do not have a junior ROTC program. Um, if, uh, if the district offers additional credits above the 21, what are these areas? And so I tried to put these in kind of an order um, with, and you see in 2010, the, di the districts that offered additional, they offered computer tech or computer apps um, or speech, an additional English course, PE, fine arts, social science, uh, senior projects, we have a lot of districts that are doing senior projects as additional credits. Uh, facts, entrepreneurship, all the way down to economics, a freshman success class. Um, there was at least one district that offered uh, American Sign Language, um, deaf studies as a requirement for graduation. And if the state were to increase grad requirements, what would be the content area that superintendents would want around the state? And number one was computers and computers. There was computer technology, computer apps, um, some sort of technology based course. 
uh, personal finance, math, business and finance, uh, computers, career and life planning, career and tech ed, character ed, uh, more electives and ethics. And so that's that was from um, 2010 uh, of what superintendents thought. A couple of other things I wanna show you guys. And again, I shared these with the um, committee chairs. Um, I, I did not, I apologize. I didn't have time to type all this out, but this, these are the school districts in the state of Kansas. And these are how many credits they offer for graduation. Um, and so this is something that the, uh, the subcommittee chairs will have, and I can send this out to the committee uh, also, if you would like to see this. Um, a couple of the other pieces, this was the, if I can pull this up, oh. Sorry, I apologize. Some of the, the superintendents talked about how the senior year is made meaningful. And, you know, if I'm going to kind of look through these, a lot of them have to deal with dual credit courses. So superintendents felt that if they're taking college prep classes, uh, concurrent college credit, dual credit, um, a, a lot of, of talk about dual credit internships for seniors. So some things they uh, recommended. Um, a lot again, the dual credit, and um, the other big one was senior project or senior portfolio. So those are some consistent messages from superintendents in, in 2010. And then the last one that I did share with the uh, with with the group was the general comments. And, and there's a lot of information in here um, to read through as you break into your uh, sub committees. Uh, and then the last thing that I wanted to share, and then Jim, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you and we can take some questions on the data, was this is something that we will talk about next time, but I did want you to see the committee to see that we do have right now, currently for our students, we have 191 responses. Um, and so Melanie and I are working on uh, putting that data together and making it a little bit easier for, for you guys to read. Um, and for us to really kind of determine uh, what, what things our students are asking. Just a reminder, we asked, uh, you know, what their current status is, um, what kind of demographics. So you can see some demographics of small school, large school, rural, inner city, suburb. And then the questions we asked were, what do you know about the current grad requirements in Kansas? And I, I think as we go through here, just a quick overview, a lot of our kids, they don't know anything about them. Um, and that's, um, I mean, that's the truth. And so I don't know if, if part of that is, is the message that as schools, that's something we need to do a better job of. Um, what are some challenges as you work to graduate from your high school? What were some things as you work through grad requirements? And then what, what was a class you would have liked to be required and a required class you took that you wish you didn't have to? And then what else do we need to know? So those are the questions that we have asked uh, students or former students. Um, and again, I'm, I'm excited just last week, we only had 38 responses, so we're up to almost 200. So we're gonna get some really good data to be able to share uh, with the task force and with the subcommittees. So um, at that, Jim, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and then we can take questions if anybody has them. Um, I have shared that data with the subcommittee chairs, so they have that in order to use for some of the discussion uh, in those uh, subcommittees. Jared, and the first question I have for you is uh, related to a, a screenshot that you had up there for probably less than a second, mm -hmm. which was uh, how did the uh, superintendents and administrators back in 2010 feel about uh, changing uh, the, or upgrading the graduation requirements? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen real quick because I didn't mean to scan over that one. So here was one of the questions they asked, should graduation requirements be increased? 230 superintendents said no and 59 said yes. So yes, that is a very important piece to know. And this was again in 2010. Thanks for pointing that out, Jim. Yeah, that, that's, that, that was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, that <clears throat> that response, you know, would you characterize that as a, a consistent response today? 
I don't, that's a great question. I'm not sure. I, I think it would be very interesting um, to, uh, to, to do this, the survey again, you know, right now. Um, and uh, just to see some of the, the responses moving forward. Yeah, that was a pretty extensive uh, uh, survey they did, especially in light of the fact that it had to be basically hand done as opposed to the many ways we can collect data today through technology. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Is anyone having yeah. any questions over the data? Jared, I've got one from the chat. Um, someone's asking if we can continue accepting student responses to that survey. And I'm thinking we could probably do that maybe even through the end of next week. I, I think through the end of next week, absolutely. I think that'd be great um, if you have more because the, the more data we have, the, the better. I think it's, I think, you know, as we talk about and, and something that the task force has really talked about was stakeholders. And I think our students and current, you know, recent graduates are some of the, the biggest stakeholders that we um, are going to have to listen to. I agree. I, one of the things that I've noticed reading through that data is uh, you get some really interesting insights once they head off to college, right? Mm -hmm. I think I saw a hand go up. Jean? Uh, yes, um, I did have a question. It's interesting that while the vast majority of superintendents said don't increase the graduation requirements, which you know we have our 21, M many of the districts in the list exceed that on their own initiative to probably meet some local requirement. So it, 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 uh, it's kind of conflicting there. And I, I don't quite understand why. I think that might tell us something that, that, that maybe districts want to have more uh, individual requirements that are that meet their local needs so I, I just think that was a really interesting dichotomy there like any good research project it's uh it it, it <clears throat> creates more questions and then solves answers solves problems or or answers questions you know there's there's a lot of, a lot of things to be unpacked from that uh, um, that effort. It, it's in interesting to note that after the, uh, I wondered about why did this uh, task force cease at that time? I mean, when it, and I'm I'm sure that uh, Diane DeBacher, who was the commissioner at that time and initiated this, um, saw the need uh, to change and. Um, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but they were certainly looking uh, to the future. Um, and then the, this uh, task force seems to have uh, uh, ceased. At, you know, it, it just ended. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> when I came onto the board in 2012, there was no mention of it. I was quite startled when I found this, you know, <laughs> this survey, uh, this information. Um, and what's changed today that uh, our educators feel like we should be upgrading, changing, or moving forward with graduation requirements. And I'd offer that question to the, uh, to the task force. I would just like to say, I think there's been a lot of changes since 2010. And maybe it would be really worthwhile to send out that uh, survey to superintendents again. Um, I, our world today is nowhere near what we had in 2010. Uh, and there's probably a lot of other considerations so it might be helpful to have that data. I could also posit that we were still in no child left behind. And I wonder <laughs> how that frame of reference of leaving, uh, of uh, living under those assessments had on us um, as we thought philosophically about the reason that what education should be about. So there, there is a change also in, in how we were running schools, in my opinion, based on the No Child Left Behind, which was between the 2002 and 2015. So 
just a thought. Yeah, and I'll just add something here off the chat. Mark Tallman, you're exactly right. I think that's something not to forget is there is a difference between increasing the requirements, which is something the superintendents didn't want back then, and changing the requirements. And so I think that's something as we move forward, we need to make sure we're having that discussion is do we want to change? And, and I think that's, that's really as we break into those subcommittees. And I know Jim will talk about that charge here in a minute is to really ask that, you know, if, if we're going to change, what's there, there has to be reason behind that. Um, and so I think that's all the, the purpose that we're, that we're moving forward. So thanks for throwing that out there, Mark. So just to uh, uh, keep the classroom going, I have uh, some directed questions. Uh, Susan, I would ask you, what, what would be your response to uh, that, res that, that uh, information from 2010 that uh, they didn't want to change and why we, we should change today? I think we've already kind of heard, you know, the big answer, the world has changed so much in the last decade or so. <laughs> Um, I really do agree that uh, superintendents were answering that question coming off of, you know, a couple of decades of uh, no child left behind, adequate yearly progress, all of the mandates that were um, somewhat challenging to, uh, to, to, to meet, uh, and districts were being compared uh, in a, a way that uh, was, they had never, I think, experienced quite the same. Um, I also think across the field, our knowledge in the field of just our perception of the disconnect between what the workforce needs and where the opportunities are for our kids uh, up against the, you know, what kids know and what skills and knowledge they have based on a graduation requirement from our high schools. That I think we all got much more aware of that gap um, and uh, have reflected on how do we create more opportunity for our students um, by thinking through what high school should look like. So I, I guess those are the things I'm reflecting on. My, my sense of the opportunities I have to work with superintendents is there's much more openness to um, how do we change to meet our students' needs and how do we open more doors for future opportunity for our students. That's Good answer, thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm gonna reach out to outside our uh, task force and put Mark Tallman on the spot, not that he's ever you know, hesitated to speak up, but uh, Mark, you've been on the success tour with uh, uh, Dr. Watson more than uh, anybody else. Uh, how would you relate the success tour, tour narrative uh, to the work of the task force at this time? Is Mr. Tallman there, or is he at the at the, at the success tour? Um, well, I'm kind of at the success oh. tour. Um, I apologize. <laughs> I'm stealing Wi-Fi from a Panera while waiting for the next success tour in Spring Hill, um, so I'm trying to be quiet. I would simply say that having been to many of these, I think the reaction is very positive around the idea some of those things, we need to be evaluating students on much more relevant, real world experiential activities that they see relevance and will relate to preparation. Um, there's strong support for that. How do you fit that into a system that now essentially just, just counts units for the most part? So my observation is, there's a lot, there continues to be real enthusiasm for that idea of change, but obviously not a lot of agreement on what, what that would look like. And while I have the floor, before I mute myself and or get kicked out of the Panera, I think it would be interesting to see whether it's possible to link some of that data. For example, the number of credits required in different districts. If we have that, can we compare that to results such as what are your graduation rates or your post-secondary effective rate or, or things like that? It's, it's interesting to see that there are differences, but is, is there anything to suggest that you get different results based on that? It would be important to somehow control for, for demographics if we did that. So thank you for the question. 
Yes, thank you for the answer. And, and thanks for speaking up in Panera's. Yeah. So to the task force, um, a question would be, uh, do we need to survey superintendents or administrators uh, more to find out their uh, their direct feelings? We've, we've talked to uh, different groups, you represent them. Should we be reaching out Jim, I do believe that might be a missing piece right now and be very important for two reasons. One is just to get their feedback, see how that information has changed in the past decade, um, but also just moving forward to make them feel like they have a piece of this buy-in. Like I think um, if we avoid that, then we're missing a critical piece. Yes, I, did. I, I would agree. And that also opens the door to other stakeholders who we have yet to communicate with when there's a vast number of those. Um, and I might at this time offer uh, uh, that you can contact Jared or I uh, regarding stakeholders who you would like to see involved with our process or in, in, in connected and, and communicated with, because we need their voice uh, to send that to Jared or I. We have started to put together a, um, a, a listing uh, by uh, category as well as specifics of uh, those individuals and groups and organizations that need to be uh, a part of the conversation and we need to be bringing that information back to you as a task force. So um, I can insert that here. Um, and Jared, we can put them on our list. You yeah, know, I, I'll, I'll second that, Jim. I just we, we have started to put together that list. And so if there's somebody that you guys know or an organization, uh, Jim and I will put that on our list and we'll, we'll communicate with them uh, where we're at and, and what we're doing. So um, let, us, let us know, send us an email who those uh, people are. And don't assume that, uh, that, that we know all the stakeholders that need to be contacted. You know, and uh, that can be, as we have uh, delineated, you know, either by organization or elected official or individuals or uh, um, business and industry folks that need to be at the table. Um, we are anxious to uh, receive your input on, on, on who we should be talking to and bringing to the table. So thank you. So Jared, one question to you. Uh, were you surprised at the uh, the the, the depth, depth and breadth of the uh, um, uh, work that was done in 2010? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's really good, Jim. And there's there's a lot more there that uh, even I had time to to, to go through. And so I, I think it's uh, it, it's really good information. I, and I I think you're right. You know when. When Susan talked and, and some different people said that, you know, that the times were definitely different, but I still do think there's some stuff there that's applicable and is good information um, to use. You know, I will share also that that Jim and I have had multiple conversations already with uh, with some other states, with other organizations um, as we start to move forward and, and more people uh, and, and some of you may have been asked uh at different times but more people are starting to to talk a little bit more about this uh task force and ask questions um as we we get farther into it and i think as we get ready to start here in just a few the the subcommittees i think they're going to even start to ask more questions which which is good yes it, it, there, it, we, we we need to uh make sure that we have uh, uh listened uh, we, we've been talking amongst ourselves now. We've had opportunities for uh, national views and state views and experiences. And now we're, we're getting closer to, uh, we're, we're not getting closer, we are indeed uh, focusing on our, our, ourself, which I guess leads us into uh, the organization of uh, task force subcommittees. You know, um, Jared, any last comments on uh, data or Melanie? No, I don't, I don't think so, Jim. Okay, All right. Thank you both Jared and Melanie for uh, bringing us up to date on the data. And I would remind the uh, task force that the data we were talking about was uh, not 
including the uh, 2010 survey, uh, was the data that you provided us, you know, when the subgroup in the small groups after our meetings. So that was your response, you know, to the questions that we were giving. And I think that's really important as we go forward. It's given us a lot of uh, direction and a lot of a lot of interesting uh, questions that we can ask in the future. So thank you for what you've done so far. At this particular time, uh, organizing the task force uh, subcommittees. Now, <clears throat> the background of this is Dr. Watson's original charge to the task force was to study and make recommendations to the State Board of Education in three specific areas. First was to identify courses that should be added or should no longer be required for graduation. The second was to conduct a review of all competencies and identify multiple ways to show mastery of skills that will allow students to move at their own pace and more. Uh, the third was to study the benefits of or the need for requiring value added assets in addition to the high school diploma, such as industry recognized certificates, college credits, um, success in a particular area, uh, such as foreign language, you know, what are those things that we need to uh, look at for the future for, ad for added value uh, to the diploma and therefore as well as the, the transcript. So those are the three charges that we were given. And I think it's important um, that we uh, address those questions as a subcommittee. And I, I was uh, quite pleased to know and to see that um, these are basically the questions that just came out of the, uh, the information that was presented. How coincidental is that? You know, so uh, happily, you are all going to be uh, part of a subcommittee of uh, one or another. Uh, the subcommittees will meet uh, during our regularly scheduled meeting times or at discretion of the committee chair um, as they provide their leadership. I anticipate subcommittees will report back to the task force at the January 20th meeting. That doesn't mean we're not gonna to continue to meet and have topics and issues to discuss and, and, and learn about uh, during our, our task force meetings uh, that both will continue, but each subcommittee will have uh, time to meet during uh, our regularly scheduled meetings. And on that note, uh, in, when you uh, receive your summary report of this meeting today, uh, we will provide a, uh, a listing of all dates for meetings as we can see them right now uh, through uh, the May 20th meeting uh, next year. Um, we just have a few more bases to cover on uh, making sure we have all those dates in, in the right order. Some things have come up and other things that, that keep us changing. So I don't wanna, I wanna minimize that change. So today, what I'd like to do is uh, organize our uh, subcommittees. And the first thing is the leadership of those subcommittees and the leadership for uh, the, the subcommittees. Uh, the first one, courses to be added or deleted. The, the chair for this subcommittee will be Christy Meyer, who's the principal at Goddard Eisenhower High School. Uh, leadership for the competencies and mastery uh, subcommittee. Um, Ed Raines, principal at Topeka Washburn Rural High School will be the uh, uh, subcommittee chair. And for value added uh, review, uh, Kelly Nesser, the principal at Lyons High School. All three are members of our task force and all three have agreed to uh, uh, be um, the chairs of these uh, different subcommittees. Uh, members have been assigned to subcommittees and in just a moment, you'll be sent to the meeting rooms. You know, But before we do that, I would wanna say that uh, these are probably um, the core for what Dr. Watson and the state board uh, want to have. But it, at, at the core, I will also be looking for questions and, uh, and the conversations that you're going to have uh, relative to the three different themes that we're, we're looking at. Um, we have resources from the Kansas State Department of Education. We have resources in terms of uh, uh, Education Commission of States and Joel Moore uh, for the subcommittees. Um, and I'm sure that there are others that would be happy to assist us at any time. It really has been um, very exciting to start to see people around the state take uh, notice of uh, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And this uh, 
is coming together at just the right time to have these three subcommittees. So Jared, are we ready to move into the subcommittees? Yeah, just a couple reminders yeah. as we go in there, Jim. Uh, you know, we have questions that I sent to the chairs to kind of help guide uh, discussions. Um, and Thank you. We'll, I will put together that data and send the, that to the chair um, following the meeting. Um, I did also talk with, you mentioned Joel Moore from ECS. I, I think he has communicated with each one of the chairs that he is a really good resource and he can help with, uh, with contacts if you guys um, need those. Um, and then what, what we'll do is we'll break in. We have a, a roughly about 45 minutes um, to kind of have some discussions in those subcommittees. And then we'll, uh, Peggy will put the, the timer on. We'll come back into the main meeting. Uh, we may have you guys just take just a quick minute to kind of talk a little bit about maybe what your discussion uh, was in your subcommittees. And then we'll, we'll Jim, you'll, you'll close up our meeting and, and we'll get finished even if we're finished a little bit early. So uh, Peggy, did you have any details before we break out that, that you had? Well, let's do a quick little, um, you know, I know in, in our uh, group, we had some outstanding discussion and, and probably could have continued to to keep talking. So I think um, a good start. Uh, let's uh, let's have a quick little overview. Uh, Dr. Meyer, do you want to kind of start? Just give a, a quick little rundown of of what you guys discussed in in your group. Sure, and I, I'm glad to hear that it wasn't just us that felt. I mean, I really feel like we could just kept talking all morning. Uh, it was very productive, wonderful ideas, um, lots of big picture ideas, and I think one of our focus points right now is how do we scale this back and have a manageable plan. Um, what does that look like? And so we're, we're starting to focus in on really looking at mastery versus seat time um, competencies. We talked about, um, we had you know some really good ideas as far as making really big changes, but we talked about how important it is um, because we are dealing with you know the entire public and everyone who's been a part of education um, that we need to be looking at things either in small steps um, as we go along, you know, not just a big, huge change in six months and or combining some of our ideas and plans into the current system so that it is more accepted um, and people can deal with it and, and understand the benefit and, and move forward in that way. Um, we also had some information about some more data that we need and um, who we need to visit with. So that is in the plan and, and will be presented um, in our notes for the next meeting. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Raines, Ed, your group. Again, uh, great group, uh, great discussions. Um, I think you know one of the things that emerged was that uh, we need to we need to learn a lot more about what the various models of competency or mastery based um, attainment of um, credits toward graduation look like in other states. And I shared some of the preliminary information that that we had related to that. But a lot more learning to do there. Um, and uh, good discussions about whether or not you know that should uh, be determined at the state level or whether districts uh, should have individual autonomy to do those things. Um, uh, other things that we brought up, uh, a whole list of questions uh, that we talked about. But uh, Mark Tallman um, uh, brought up the fact that you know it's going to be important uh, in in uh, the environment that we're in. Um, with respect to competency or mastery based education to have some kind of a, a quantifiable measure of attainment of whatever the, the course um, objectives would have been. Uh, people are going to want to see that, particularly uh, decision makers. So what does that look like? Uh, and we've got some more work to do there. And then another good point that was made was uh, related to the kids emotional well being. Um, you know, you go down the you go down the way or the road of uh, competency based uh, or mastery based attainment and kids can move at their own pace. Um, you may have kids graduating early. Um, are they emotionally ready to take the next step? Um, I have I have uh, uh, an administrator in my building whose whose kid was accelerated. Um, and so uh, she's a 16 year old junior easily could be a kid that racked up enough credits through competency-based measures or um, uh, mastery-based measures uh, to be done by the end of this year. And so a 16-year-old going into college, what are, the, what are the implications there? But a lot of really good conversation. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the questions that were generated, I think uh, will be illuminative uh, for the rest of the group uh, once those are disseminated. Awesome. Okay, Kelly, last group. 
Yeah, we had a great discussion as well. It's like the other two committees uh, have said there. So, you know, trying to grasp uh, what, what, it, what is all going to evolve and what the possibilities might be. Uh, obviously, uh, with the market value assets or the diploma plus, uh, just what does what would qualify for it, uh, trying to make sure that the the small districts as through the large districts have have equal type of access to creating such a, a, a diploma plus or market value assets. And so uh, creating and, and keeping the stakeholders involved and, uh, you know, making sure the timelines and things, but, you know, there, there's a lot of different possibilities, obviously, uh, and they may, they may vary from different parts of the state uh, from state or from region to region, but yet, uh, it's still something there which uh, can be a benefit to our kids uh, with this, uh, either the market value asset or the diploma plus type of diploma. So uh, probably more questions right now than answers, without a doubt. Awesome. Well, uh, thank, thank you for uh, all three of you guys for facilitating those conversations. I will get the data, um, those, those questions and everything that uh, were written down. I will send those to you by tomorrow is my goal. And then I will spend my holiday weekend looking over them to make sure we get them all um, organized for the task force. But uh, outstanding discussions. Um, Jim, I, I think we're making, I, I really like the, the uh, direction we're going. You know, it's, it's exciting to know that now we're getting in the weeds and we've been kind of um, looking from a, a, a big, big vision. And now we're starting to get into um, some of the specifics. And, and as Kelly said, there's always more questions as you dive farther into things. Um, so thank you guys for, for taking that leadership role. So Jim, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you to uh, kind of finish this up and it looks like we'll get down a little early today. I think you're on mute, Jim. There you go. Thank you. You, you might've liked it better on mute. <clears throat> Um, first of all, um, uh, thank you to uh, the chairs and to all the participants in the uh, subcommittees. Uh, I was with the courses added and deleted, and uh, uh, it, Christy did a great job. It was a great conversation. Um, I just wish I could have been in all of them. Uh, it was, uh, I'm sure, it, as robust a <clears throat> conversation as you can have. Um, and thank you all for your, your, your participation. Uh, but one statement did come out in, in it just came out uh, and it struck me as kind of almost a theme after I'm listening to the uh, conversation. And uh, we got to watch out. We're not, you know, it looks like we might be freaking everybody out <laughs> because of the conversations we're having are just so rich. And, and, and if we take them out to the public right now, that could get pretty scary, you know, because there's, we don't have a foundation around them. And the charges and the challenge we have is not to freak everybody out, uh, but to provide opportunities and structures that will uh, improve uh, the uh, graduation um, expectations and results in the future. Uh, but we, we, we very well might be freaking everybody out when we get done with this. I, I love that statement, you know. Um, there's a lot more conversation to go. I, I know I felt like in our group that uh, the conversation could have kept going. It, it, was, it was really getting into the heart of the matter and it's sorry that the time you know, takes us away from that. Uh, we will be providing you uh, shortly with the summary of the meeting and also with um, um, information about uh, future meeting dates and make sure we're all on the same page on that. I think that's really important. Uh, that we do that housekeeping task, I know. Uh, once again, I, I'd ask if you have any um, input you want to share with uh, 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 um, Jared and I about stakeholders. And in the next meeting, we'll provide you some uh, uh, start with that. Uh, I I'm, will be meeting uh, with uh, some folks this week, some legislators uh, who have caught wind of what we're doing and want to catch up. It should be an interesting conversation, you know, um, and I'm sure we're going to all have interesting conversations and each of you is a stakeholder and represents a particular group. And I would encourage you to contact your group and uh, build uh, the, the foundation for future conversations 
um, relative to the graduation requirements. Okay, um, Jared, I think maybe we will get out of here just a few minutes early. But on a personal note, I want to tell you that I'm going to turn over uh, the uh, leadership of our uh, uh, task force to Jared uh, for uh, some period of time that I don't know. Uh, the reason for that is I will be uh, having a uh, colon cancer operation next uh, week from today. Lucky me. And uh, I'm going to be kind of focused on getting healthy again, you know, um, I will tell you that uh, so far, everything looks like it's going to be a positive experience. Uh, and when I say that, I mean, it's going to be, uh, it, it's recorded early. I would tell you right now, um, get a colonoscopy. <laughs> I had them regularly for about the last 20 years and uh, um, uh, they are, they work, you know, and um, I, we think we've caught it early. It's in a, a, a reasonably good spot. So we'll see what happens, but uh, we'll let you know. I'm sure that uh, you'll all have uh, uh, supportive feelings. The, the folks around me, my family and friends have been very supportive. And uh, I look forward to rejoining the group quickly. So uh, just so you know, it, it is interesting how news gets out there because I've had people contact me about all kinds of distressing things that <laughs> they've heard is going to happen. So I wanted to make sure you heard it from me. Um, and, uh, it's, so it's next Tuesday, next, excuse me, next Thursday, I'll be tied up for a while, but I will be following your, uh, journey and looking forward to getting back and, and connected once again. The next meeting is scheduled for September 16th and, uh, Jared, you guys are ready to go. And based on the conversations we've just had, I, I, I we're not, we're in the weeds now. We're ready to go. So thank you all. Uh, uh, for your uh, participation and your enthusiasm to be part of this group. And I, I'm looking forward to the January 20th reports and also the, the May when we finally give our, our final report to the state board. So with that, we'll close the meeting. Uh, Jared, thanks. And thanks to everyone uh, for being here. And I look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you.